Hi right, guys, Dave Mad Max 6 and we are back at the Mecca for J Cutler TV and I have my very good friend Rico McClinton on uh, Muscle Beach TV. This is a long time coming Rico and I had to chase you down for this one. <laughs> <laughs> I know Dave, but we got it now, we're going to get it going man. Why did you make it so hard to come on the show man? Man, you know, I've been busy <laughs> taking care of things. You know how it is, guys. You get busy, get caught up with stuff. That's all. That's what Jay said. He said, you must be really busy. I yeah. said, so am I. That's what I said. That's it, man. But, you know, I'm here <laughs> now, and I'm, I'm excited to do it. Rico, thank you so much. Uh, I've wanted to do this interview, and Jay actually has been asking me and asking me to get you on, on Muscle Beach TV because he said, you got to get Rico. He's got all the good stories, man, from the old days, and we, we get we got to get him on the show. So uh, the reason also why I wanted to have you on the show is because, of course, uh, Chris Cormier, your good, good friend and brother, Chris Cormier, just released an awesome documentary called I Am The Real Deal, and, of course, you're in it. Yeah. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what it was like to, for you to tell some of the um, uh, some of uh, the stories on this documentary and some things that we've never heard about bef before on any uh, movies or videos, including when you and Flex actually had to sit down with him and tell him, you know, we can't deal with some of the things you're doing. We can't be training partners anymore. How, how hard was that for you to actually t t tell certain stories like that uh, on camera? Well, I mean, people ask me questions. I like to be honest, you know, so... I just want to be honest about it because we, we love Chris and you know friends I think friends speak the hard truth also you don't just butter the guy up you don't just tell him what he wants to hear to me that's not a the kind of friends I really need tell me the hard stuff too because that's when you grow you have to refine the character right so it wasn't easy you know what I mean because we we had a close friendship we spent a lot of time together but we was hoping to tell him that so he would quit doing it not not so we would be like okay you're out like maybe he would reevaluate it reassess it and then be like you know what it's not worth it yeah. So we did it for that reason, you know, and, and telling the story, he's doing a lot better now. So it's easier to tell it because he's not still in the situation. Right. Yeah. So he's, he's come through it. So it's not like I'm talking about something that's he's still doing yeah, and, yeah. and it's his secret. And you know what I mean? And that's kind of what I want to talk about. It's like the kind of thing that um, really no one wants to talk about it. I mean, Chris was always known for the guy to want to have a good time. He was very successful as a bodybuilder, but there was this other side of his life where he wanted to have fun and he wanted to party and all that stuff. And it was kind of like if you knew Chris on a personal level, you kind of knew that stuff, but it was very secretive. It was not out in the open. Yeah. It wasn't talked about in the magazine, of course. So uh, you guys, of course, you and Flex probably knew the most out of everybody because you were always together. Right. And it's the kind of thing that you don't want to tell people because you don't want people to think bad of your friend. No, right? not at all. It, but... But he didn't really do it around us, right? And it kind of we started kind of hearing things, and he would kind of go hang out uh, around different people, I guess, who also enjoyed doing that. Yeah. So around us, you know, he didn't do it. And if we, and if and if we were gonna have a drink, we'd all talk about you want to have a drink tonight. Then we might have one drink, and we all agreed to it. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And then it's one drink, and we'll hang out and dance or something like that. But it was never like let's go get drunk, let's go do any kind of social drugs because I think that the sport of bodybuilding bodybuilding involves other things right yeah. so i'm like why would i add to it yeah yeah so it's to bad me, enough that, as it is yeah that never made sense to to like double down you know what yeah, i mean yeah, yeah, yeah. and then this certain thing is like hindering your progress so i didn't i couldn't connect with that you How know you explain that he did so well even though he was doing that genetic <laughs> freak let me tell you man we talked about that man flex we didn't get it but we figured there has to be a time where you hit the wall because it's still a a, a body you know, you can get away to, with it for so long, but there has to be a time when the body can't take all that stuff combined, you know? Yeah, he's human still. Yeah. yeah, but he, but the sad part is even now when I watch the videos and I watch them and we were in it together and when you live it, you're, you're in it together and it's different. But now you step away and you watch the videos, I'm looking going, man, he probably could have been so much better if he didn't do that. I know. I you think know? he knows also. Yeah, and I see it clearly now sitting back, not living it because you're so focused on getting bigger. You never feel big enough. You never feel, you know, you're so into it. You don't really, I don't think we see things clearly. We may not ever see how great we might look at the moment because we're so busy trying to achieve the next goal. And chasing always. Yeah, so, yeah, so now sitting back watching him pose now that, I'm like, man, my man was great. He could have been so much better, I'm sure. Yeah. You know, so were you. I mean, Jeff was just telling me at the front desk. He says, oh, my God, I saw some of the old video with Rico. He was massive. dude. <laughs> you were big, dude. You know, was... what's funny is I look at pictures of me now also. And I, and I go, man, I would look at the photo and I would always think now I think, man, I was pretty big. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but when I was living, it, I'm like, I got to get bigger. I, know. I would measure myself. I would weigh myself. And I always said these. I was at one point I was like 312 Jeez. and I was thinking I'm going to go to 326. 
312 is not big enough for my height. I got to walk on stage at this or that. So you really, I think sometimes we, we, it's blurred for us because we're so busy wanting to be great, you know? Yeah, it's skewed. It's not reality. Yeah. yeah. Um, talk to me about some of the, he was telling me stories like, uh, I don't know if you told me on camera or not, but he said you, get, you and him were working, Chris and you, uh, yourself were working, you know, at nightclubs, doing security and all that stuff. And sometimes you come home so late, by the time it was time to either decide to go to sleep or stay up so you could actually go work out, you just stay up and then go straight to the gym the next day. Well, the <laughs> truth of the matter is we work, we get off late, we might go eat. And then he look at me, cause we, like, so unlike Flex, me and Chris love video games. And he'd be like, want to go play some video games? Like, oh, I got a few games. And we're both very competitive. So it can go back and forth. Like, if I lose, I don't want to quit losing. If he loses, let's get another one. And there are times the sun will come up. We'd be like, oh, if we go to sleep, we're going to miss the workout. So we, I remember we, one time we, we, we drove down to Venice. We stopped. We got some donuts and some quarts of milk. And we drank, ate the donuts, drank the quarts of milk, and we came and did legs. Oh, dude. Yeah. And I remember waking up like, is your set? We did a leg workout. And oh we still laugh God. about that. Yeah. That's hardcore, dude. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, because when people think Cormier or you or Flex, we always picture the three of you guys together. You were like the three musketeers. Mm -hmm. always. And eventually Danny Hester came on board and David Young and like yeah. Paul Dillett. But you guys were the three at the core of, of the training team, right, uh -huh. with Charles. So how did you meet these guys? Because you told me off camera that it was very, very interesting. I don't think people actually know how the, guy, how the three of you guys got together. So tell me from, take me from the beginning when you actually start hanging out with these guys and you know, how you guys get together. Okay, um, I was 18, 18, I did a show, it was called The Teenage Black America, it was an AAU show, and I used to train at this guy's gym, and he goes, hey man, it's not many competitors, you can ride with me, I'll drive you up, you can do the show, I didn't know anything about dieting, I'm like, okay, I, I go in his tanning bed, he drives me down, I didn't diet or anything, I go down there, there's one other teenager in the show, it happens to be Flex, uh -oh. He beats me. He's skinny, but he's in shape. But he was skinny, man, <laughs> with a jerry curl. <laughs> like this, this skinny guy's about to beat me, <laughs> right? <laughs> Were you bigger, but just not I was lean? bigger. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know about really dieting yet, right? Okay. I, you know, you're, you're a teenager, you're trying to get big, right? He beats me. I'm like, man. So, I, so they were having. A, they're gonna do. It's gonna be the teenage America. So the guy Jack was going back, and I go, you tell that guy I'm coming to get him. Tell him I'm coming to get him at Teen America. I'll see him again. And Flex told me he had got the message, right? And then I was at my gym, shook a guy's hand. We had just got with chicken pox, gave me chicken pox. So I didn't see Flex again until mm. right after he won the cow. Then, then they're telling me about this amazing guy who won the Mr. California. This guy looks amazing. I walk in the gym. We look at each other. We remember each other. We smiled. And, and we became like fast friends, you know? <laughs> I what mean, year was that, the cow? He won the cow in like 89. Okay. And I hadn't seen him since him in 89. There's this guy is. And I remembered him and we smile and then we, we started talking and I did a show like one year in San Diego and he I remember he drove down from Fresno. He goes, I'm gonna drive you. He drove down from Fresno, picked me up in my house and drove me to San Diego. So you could compete? Yep. So he, yeah. was, he was just there to support you. Yep. Awesome. I mean and he drove. He literally wow. drove from Fresno, came to my house, That's a drive. picked me up. Yeah. yeah, and then drove me to San Diego. See wow. a lot of people don't know about that about me. I never forget that. He had a little Suzuki uh, Jeep. Oh, little um, samurai. Yeah, a little Suzuki samurai. With, <laughs> he always had big speakers in his car. We're booming, but that's how our friendship started. Wow. You know, and later on we became roommates and all that. And oh, really? I didn't know. Okay. Yeah, we lived together for a year in Marina del Rey. We're okay. roommates, and um, then Chris. I met Chris. He was young. He was training for I don't know if he's training for Cal. He just won like the Teen Nationals, and we're in the second room and we're joking around, talking smack to each other, and then we hit it off. And then I think right like right before after Cal. Um, we planned to hang out, and then Chris came, and we, me and Flex went to pick Chris up. We went to a club downtown, and we hung out, and we danced. And after that, we all started to train together. And you so know, the friendship. Was, was Chris living here at that time, or he moved shortly after? Um, when he, you moved, first met him? he moved here like shortly after, okay. and he and he lived in Venice. Yeah. Yeah. Then whenever he would, whenever he would go to Palm Springs, I would like stay at his house, his apartment, and stuff. You know, because <laughs> I was a single guy. You know, I'd be like, hey, man, I'm going to stay at your place, man. He, he said, I'm going to leave the key on top of the lamp. And I would go stay at his place. You know, I was single, man, you know. So I would stay, <laughs> stay at his place. Oh, that's <laughs> yeah, awesome. I'm going to pause. I'm like, leave the key on the lamp for me. Yeah. How was that relationship? It always seems to me when Chris tells stories, at least, because I don't talk to Flex that much. I'm closer to Chris than I am to Flex. But it always seems to me that when Chris tells stories that him and uh, Flex always had this r very strong rivalry and you were always the voice of reason. You were always the buffer between the two of them. How was that? Well, sometime actually it got on my nerves because, you know, I was close to both of them and because they were so close, like like Flex won the USA in 92, yep. Chris won in 93. That's right. 
you know, and, and, and they will push each other. But sometimes I think you got the competitive, the competitive side, the competitive side can mess with the friendship a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And that bothered me because I have this thing about people now. I, mean, I have this thing about loyalty and friendships. Like, don't just let certain things come between it and, and cause friction because that thing's going to pass. That's right. It just, you know what I mean? The competitive days are going to be over, you know, and I always believe that. So sometimes it did bother me because somebody, he'd be mad and I'll flex would be mad and get all, then it would get, I'm like, come on, man. You were you always know? the buffer. Between yeah, the I was the middle man because I was friends with, well, I was close to both of them. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, and so sometimes it got on my nerves. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm like, come on. You're always dude. stuck in the middle. Yeah, and, and I was. I was literally stuck in the middle. And I'd be like, he'd be upset. Oh, what do you think, man? Dude? I'm like, come on, man. <laughs> How um, do you feel? Because I'm sure, I mean, Flex, especially at the beginning, was doing better than Chris. It always seems like Chris was chasing Flex until he finally beat him at the Ironman in 2000. Right. But before that, Flex was always over Chris. Uh, did the dynamic change after 2000? Did, uh, could you feel a change between Flex's behavior or, or attitude towards Chris after he got beat in 2000? Do you remember anything like that? Well, well Flex was, was almost finished competing at that point, too, you know. I, um, I think the last one was 03, right? Before his comeback. Yeah, yeah. He, 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 um, he, he got beat by Chris. At the Ironman, he was too soft. But then the very next weekend, he beat Chris at the Arnold. That's right. You see, That's so right. then Flex felt okay. So they didn't last long. He was mad. Okay. For one then week. He, yeah. <laughs> then Chris. Then that day, that's one time me and Chris got into this group because Chris thought Chris came off stage, got upset with me because he thought I was rooting louder for Flex. But you root for both. Right. I'm like, dude. And then Chris is mad at me. I'm like, dude, I'm rooting for both of you guys. That's the one. And Chris remembers too. I was. So, that's the one time I was so mad at Chris. I had to walk away. Really? I was so offended, right? I was so mad. He remembers. I, that's the one time I was really mad. <laughs> I just had to walk away. <laughs> I can't picture you being mad. You're always such in a good mood all the time. But but just to say that to me, like, dude, I'm rooting for both of you guys. Yeah. Like, but I think Chris is really upset because he had just beat Flex, then yeah. he loses the next weekend. Yeah. You know, but Flex had tightened up. Yeah. You know, so, but it was up to the judges. It wasn't up to me. So I think it was more of that. Well, I'm sure it lit the fire on, under Flex's ass to get beat by Chris the week before, so he was like, holy shit. It's the same thing as when De uh, Chris lost to Dexter in 05 at the, uh, yeah. at the Arnold, won the week after in, Sa in San Francisco. Yeah. Same oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. So, you know, um, after that, it was it was cool, but Chris was still kind of in that deep party mood yeah, then yeah, anyway, yeah. and Flex was I already at quick compete. I quit in 2000, so Flex was coming in to almost quitting. and. Yeah. And Chris was still there, but he still had that partying thing going on. He was like down in Orange County, you know. So that's right. You've yeah. been in Vegas for a while, Orange County. When was that year that you and uh, you and Flex told Chris, "Listen, you need to straighten out because we don't like what's going on, and you need to, you know, change your ways, otherwise we can't train with you." What year was that? Oh, man, I can't remember. I really can't. I don't want to lie. It's right? blurry. Yeah. yeah, but I remember that. But I don't remember what year it was. But I remember okay. the conversation, you know, and it was just too much. That must to, have been really that. hard for you guys. Yeah, because it's like. I don't know, man. It's like it, you see it, and you you personally can't control it. You know what I mean? Because he's a grown man, yeah. but you can see how clearly how damaging it is. Yeah. You know, so it's frustrating. Because yeah. we don't want to be like, okay, man, we ain't we've done with you. Like we, you know what I mean? Because we still want the friendship. Like, dude, we yeah. can't, we can't. Basically, it's, it's kind of like saying we can't watch you do this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it was more of that. Yeah, so hopefully that would inspire him, but he but he had other people who were willing to do it with him because yeah, yeah. a lot of people just want to be around Chris Cormier. Oh, yeah, he said he had the whole posse wherever he went. Yeah, because yeah. It's, it's Chris Cormier, yeah. the, the famous bodybuilder, this and that, and he's fun, and people just love being around that because, of course, he can go on to people let him in the clubs that treat him a certain does. way, yeah. and people gravitate to it and want to be around it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, so. He, he took it hard. I don't know if you saw the interview I did with him, but he, we took it really hard when you had you guys know, had that talk with him. Like for months, he didn't leave his house. He says, or he kind of just went on uh, hibernation because he lost two of his best friends. You know, so. See, I didn't know he had, he had took it that hard. Yeah. You know, and I saw the interview, but I didn't even I didn't even know. Yeah. But that because that wasn't the point. We weren't like, hey man, let's be mean to him. Let's hurt him. Let's uh -huh. hurt his feelings. It came from a Good place. a friendship. Yeah. You know, wow. which isn't easy, but I'm not, I'm not going to sit around and be like, and he overdoses. And they're like, you know, he was doing it the whole time. Did you say anything? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, yeah, we did say something, but he made he didn't the choice. Hear. Yeah. He didn't hear the time. So how long are you guys are actually training all the three? Because I remember when I first moved here in 93, right after Chris got his pro card, I remember coming to goals the first time and seeing you flex Chris, yeah. Danny Hester, Paul Dillett, and, da and, uh, and uh, David Young. Mm -hmm. in a group training together. So when did all the people, uh, you know, Danny uh, and uh, David and Paul 
joined the group like uh, after that. I know we started training with Flex, right? Me in early 90s, like 90, 91. Cause we helped Flex, Flex did, we trained, me, Chris and Flex trained together when Flex did the junior nationals, I think. And he took second to, who beat him there? Was it Kevin LeRone beat him there? That sounds right. I think Kevin LeRone, cause we trained there and we helped when we were working on Flex's posing routine when the posing room used to be downstairs. That's right. Yeah, and we were That's going the there yeah. and we were posed and we posed and we trained and Flex took second. And we did this whole routine. I think Flex posed the Superman and we did this whole routine in that posing room. So it was like 91 or so, I think 1991 we started training together. Yeah, cause Chris was there for that. Then we all trained together for the 92 USA, 93. Yep. And we trained together for a long time until that little so most of the 90s, mostly all the way through the 90s, we trained together. When did everybody start coming in, like Dillett and Danny? When did, were, they, were those added to the group? And I was told that you're the one who actually brought Danny to the group to create a buffer between you and, yeah, I mean, <laughs> and I mean, some of these Me guys. and Danny started hanging out one time. Fun, I was going to do the North America, and I got beat by um, somebody who I can't remember his name now. Uh, <laughs> it's a blur, man. I got beat by some guy. So I didn't do the North America, but I already had my tickets, so I went to watch and that Danny was there and I had never talked to Danny right I see him around we would never talk you know and we ended up talking that day and I was like man this is a cool guy and we hung out the whole time I was in Mexico and that was 94 I remember and we ended up becoming good friends Thanks. and we he's come up to my house and watch fights and when my first daughter was born and uh 94 yeah my, my her first birthday was in 95 I remember he bought her this little jacket I still got pictures uh, you know yeah. from her wearing that jacket that Danny bought her and now she's 25 she sent those pictures. I, I, I gotta find it yeah. I gotta find it but she's 25 now so that's how long uh, it's been and so yeah start training with you guys yeah Danny would cut when Danny showed up yeah he yeah, training. But you know Danny we love you though Danny know. but you know <laughs> but when he showed up he would train man because I helped I help him get ready for the Nationals one time the one in Dallas yeah. and that's the hardest he trained man and he looked great man I think he, he made, I don't know if he was second, third, but he looked amazing. I'm like, man, imagine if you train like this all the time. I know. He looked amazing. Yeah, he's gifted for sure. And then when did Paul uh, get on the scene? Dillett. When did Paul win in North America? What was that, 95 or? 94. Was it after they won the USA? Well, Paul came like early 90s too from Canada. Yeah. He was with Winston Roberts. Yeah. And I remember um, Winston introduced, he was calling him Uncle Winston. He would say, Uncle Winston. And, and Winston Roberts introduced us. Then uh, we slowly started training together, and Paul would train with us. Yeah, probably like before he won at North America. Yeah. Yeah, you know, he, he did the Montreal championship back in the day. He didn't even win that. He got second place back really? in the day, yeah. And then he came here and just exploded, you know. Yeah, he won in North America. Yeah. And me and Paul went, was in wrestling camp together for a while, too. Really? To be professional wrestlers, yeah. Oh, shit. With WWE? Yeah, uh-huh. Really? The same camp that uh, John Cena came out of, yeah. Oh, man, uh -huh. what happened with that? Mm -hmm. Well, Too big. No, no, we 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 were gonna be we were gonna be tag team partners, right? Oh, that would have been awesome. And then, because uh, all the guys would come here, I just had my daughter. I was talking to Triple H back in the corner, and he told me how much they traveled, man, like two hundred some days out oh, the year. Crazy. And I was like, dude, I just have my daughter. I'm like, I'm not leaving my daughter, You're so I quit. Yeah, no. yeah, I'm like, I always wanted to be there for my kids, right? And I just had her. I was like, man, I don't want to leave my baby. I know. To be honest, you know Good what I mean? For you, man. Yeah. So I Good didn't. I didn't do it. But I loved it. I mean, it was so much fun and the moves and and the guy was the guy they thought I, I would have did pretty good I talked oh, to a lot of guys man, I never knew that at your trial for yeah, that's awesome no I trained for a while wow trained for a while yeah how long like yeah so? a while man I'm, a year or so it was a while really? every day we go down Laguna Beach it was wow. a little guy Rick Bassman had a gym yes that's, Bassman, yeah yep. yeah Rick Bassman wow mm -hmm. yeah cool. all those moves man yeah a lot of people don't know that yeah that's that's a scoop right there, Rico. Tell me what you. I mean, you've been around obviously forever. You you you're part of this gym and its history, of course. Um, what do you, when you look at you know uh, the gym today and the, the the sports of bodybuilding, what what do you miss the most about it? Do you are you are you glad that you actually lived in that era, like you're talking about? And it seems so much different than what it is today. Not that it's it's still great, but. Around that time, you know, the 90s and the 2000s and stuff, it seems like everyone was here. You saw all that. Do you, do you miss any, do you miss that era or how do you feel about it? Well, I think that a lot of the um, bodybuilders would come here to train because the energy, yeah. it was constant energy and the competitive, the competitiveness. Yeah. But we also welcomed, like they would come and we, you know, train, sometimes they would train with us. You know, then we, afterwards we were going to eat. I remember one time Kevin LeBron came down, you know, we trained, we ate, and then we went over to, to the sushi place in Venice, and we just sat and we talked and we ate. And another time Vince Taylor was here, 
and we ended up going over Chris's house, watching Mr. Olympia video with Ronnie, ah, you know, and we're talking, we're counting how many times Ronnie was going, was saying something. We kept, he kept saying something over and over this word. We're counting. We're all laughing. <laughs> He'd be like, one, two, because, you know, he's, you know, that you text. Play the, the drinking game with that. that yeah, so, yeah, so, you know, it's that camaraderie, and we didn't really wear headphones. We were like, like. Uh, That's a big one. Right. Yeah, because if I'm training with you, I want to be next to you. I'm counting for you. I'm pushing you. I'm calling you out. Then I'll then like how many reps you get? Okay, I'm, I'm gonna grab another. Oh, how, what do you do? One ten. I'm gonna do one twenty. What do you? You, you want to stay connected. You, yeah, you yeah. got to do it. How many reps you do? How many plates? Okay, put another plate on Charles. Give. Okay, I'm gonna stay there. You know what I mean? It was yeah. like it was that to push each other, but it was also fun. Yeah. You know, instead of and I'm not knocking guys do what they do. That's up to how they want to train with I their know. training partners. But to me, it's like if you if, if you wearing if we wearing headphones. And you do your set, and then you walk away. We're kind of just doing the same movement, but we're not really training together. We're kind of occupying the same machine. Yeah. You know we're what I disconnected mean? Disconnected from the workout a little bit. Yeah, That's you know. Point. Even if you have your the guy training you, you know, you should still be there for your partner, I think. I mean, you don't have to. That's on these guys. So, you know, I'm not knocking them. Yeah. You know, but I'm, I'm telling you what I liked. I liked the, the I liked that energy going back and forth, you know, with, with a little smack talking and, to really push each other, you know, because that's what we're there for. We set a time to train together, and we showed up, and it's like, you ready to get it in? And then we got it in. I'm glad you said that because I've been watching some interview with uh, Lee Priest as of, as of recently on the, you know, RX, and he's saying that the phone to him is like a big pet peeve. And he said, if you, I guess if you're off it's not so important, but if you're prepping for a show and you're serious, don't have your phone with you because right. you can, otherwise you can you see a text or see an email that's disturbing and then it gets you, kicks you out of the workout yeah. you know, mentally. Uh, but for the same reason that you're talking about where you in tune with your trainer, you're included in the workout and you're connected. Um, so recently, because I just started training you know, hard again and I told myself, you know what? I'm not taking your phone no more. I'm going to shut down the phone while I train. And it makes a huge difference. You're right. It does because you're focused on your set. In between sets, you're resting, getting ready for the next set. You're not, your mind didn't go somewhere else, and all of a sudden it's your set again. Now you got to come back to prepare yourself for the set. Now you're resting, thinking about, okay, how many more reps I want to get? Do I want to add more weight? You're focused on the next set. You're in that zone. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? There is a difference. It'll be, like, be like watching a prize fighter, and then when he gets his men at rest, he goes, let me see my phone. And he's sitting there between rounds looking on his phone. Like, yeah, how yeah. focused is That would not work. <laughs> yeah, it's the same. You know what yeah. I mean? We should be focused, getting ready for the next set. You know, not not going on the phone for what? Is it that important? Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. It's just it's just the way it is today with social media and taping your sets and you know all that stuff. And I think that's just what's going on now. Yeah. I'm sure you're. Uh, I mean, you you still train a lot of people here. You're yeah. here a lot, right? Yeah. I'm sure that's something you require from your people. No phone, no headphones, right? Yeah. We just focus. If they have one ear pod because they want to do a set to a little music, fine. But they have one out so they can hear me, right? Yeah. Never two in. Cause then I feel like, uh, to me, I feel like you're disconnected. Like, what am I here for? That's right. But if you have one in, cause you want to put a song that's gonna hype you up, and I'm another ear, no problem. But if you have one on both, then I'm like, you don't really need me here. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I'm like, especially if someone wants to get ready for a show. Yeah. I, I have a guy I'm training, trying to put some muscle on. I said, and sometimes he, he'll do, he'll shortcut. And I'm like, man, you are you a competitor? I see you. You want to be a competitor, but do you want to be a champion? That's two different things. That's right. You know, a competitor is somebody who wants to compete. A champion, they have a different. Uh, a different uh, a commitment. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? You yeah. can walk on stage and say you compete it. Okay, fine. That's all you want. Or do you want to walk on stage and be a champion? I like it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's there's a lot of work just to be a competitor. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of money. You know? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Or do you want to be a champion? That's a different commitment. Yeah. You see, you guys listen to what Rico says. Uh, it's great advice, man, but I think I don't think it's being voiced a lot lately. And I think people just kind of see everybody else doing it. So we're all like, you know, monkeys and we're all yeah. doing the same thing. And so they think it's okay because they're yeah. doing it, you know? That's right. That's right. Yeah. So now it becomes like the norm. Yeah. Doesn't mean it's right, though. Yeah, that's right. I like that. Big difference between, you know, training back then and training today. I like that. Yeah. Wow, this was a great interview, Rico. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and, and, and tell that story and uh, and be on. Jay's going to be so, super happy. You know, he's a big friend of yours, likes oh, you a lot. I, love Jay. I remember when Jay was here with shooting with Irvin Gelb. Do you remember when he first showed up here the first time? Yeah, and we were training, and they, and Irvin Gelb was shooting him, and we like, we're like, who is this guy? Why is, who's this guy he's shooting? Like, why is he shooting this kid? <laughs> right? We remember because Jay was big and young and kind of smooth, right? The muscle wasn't mature yet, right? And we're training, and Jay's getting – photo shoot and we're like who is this kid man like, like <laughs> right and then we went to the tournament champions when he won it and we're like man this kid got potential 
you know, and I never forget we're sitting there and Flex goes, man, I hope I'm, I hope I'm going when he turns pro. And we were laughing. <laughs> I hope you're listening to that, Jay. Yeah, he wow, did. He did. Awesome. I, we were in the audience when he, when, he won, when he won tournament championships. We were sitting there right there in the Redondo Beach. Yeah. Yeah, I remember. Wow. Yeah. That is awesome. Yeah. He's going to love hearing that. Uh-huh. Wow, awesome. Rico, are you still are you still doing the movie thing? Yeah. Yeah? Tell me about I'm what's about going to go on. I'm going to do some voiceover right now. That's why I did really? this. Trip. Yeah. Oh, man, <laughs> I got to awesome. go do something for a commercial spot right now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right next door, there's some offices. That's Very funny. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Uh -huh. wow. Yeah, so it worked out perfect. Perfect. Guys, Dave Mad Max 6 for Jigglow TV with the great Rico McClinton. It's Muscle Beach TV, and we're out.